Hey, Mr. Deadly. <laughs> hey, Steve Stein. How you doing, buddy? I'm good. How are you? I'm great, man. Good. I'm glad to be here with you. Yes. It's always fun to hang out. The end. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Just kidding. Dude, it's been yeah. a while since we've done one of these live lives. Yeah. This is pretty cool. About it. Yeah. Well, I, I do them quite frequently, but I don't get to do them with you all the time, unfortunately. Okay. Oh, this is fun. So, guys, as you uh, are, are coming online with us here, we're actually live. And uh, we're doing an awesome workshop for you today on essential techniques. I'm Dan Denley, founder of Guitar Zoom. This is my good friend, Steve Stein, guitarist extraordinaire and instructor. Instru extraordinaire, both. Thank you. Um, I was going to say, too, uh, for everybody that's chatting, um, it, it, again, for whatever reason, is just showing Facebook user. So when you type something, if you can just type your first name, then we can go by that. So if you type Steve and then type whatever you want to type, then we'll know, hey, Savannah, hey, from Savannah, hi, from Oz, Montreal. So we see your messages, but they just all say Facebook users, so we, we don't know who's who. So... <laughs> Crap, it's live, bite nails. <laughs> yeah, we can do this too, yeah. We'll go like that. Yes. Wake Forest. Okay, yeah, cool. How about this, guys? Um, Steve and I love to know where you guys are from. So please just type in where you guys are joining us. Uh, Youngstown, Ohio. Yep. Anaheim. Sweden. Sean is here. Martin LaBelle. Deb Jones from Oz. Where's Oz? Kevin from Illinois is here. Nice. Annie from London. Tom from the Catskills. Manchester, UK. Chatterick. No, Catterick, UK. Sorry. Loretta. Nova Scotia. Southern Illinois. Mexico City. Holy moly. James is all over the planet. Awesome. Largo, so cool. Florida. John in Denver, Colorado. He used to live there. Minnesota, Oklahoma, Connecticut. This is so cool. I mean, Steve, you and I are old dudes. We grew up without the internet. And so just the fact that there are human beings around the planet <laughs> that are like... I know, it's amazing. Do you remember that ride at... Uh, did you ever go to Epcot? Have I ever been to Epcot? Yeah. No. Uh, anyway, well, okay. never mind. <laughs> There's a ride there and it was like, basically it was this thing of like being able to talk to each other and I remember seeing it as a little kid and thinking, wow, that will never happen. Oh, yeah. happen. It's pretty cool, man. <laughs> so <laughs> guys, awesome. thank you for being here. We really appreciate your time to uh, to take out and be with, with Steve and I today. Again, if, if you don't know who I am, I'm kind of the guy in the, in the background over here. I'm going to turn it over to Steve and I'm just here to facilitate the discussion and help uh, you guys get the most out of this live class. Today we're talking about essential techniques and um, this course that Steve is, uh, everything that we're going to do in the workshop is related to Steve's new course. It's called Essential Techniques by Steve Stein. It is the first brand new like course I think we've had in a, in a while in terms of it's, it's something you've never taught before, in, at least at this magnitude. Is that correct, Steve? Yeah. I mean, I, I always talk about different techniques, but this is the first time they've all been in one one guitar course just focusing on solely on techniques yeah right so there's as you guys know as you probably know steve has lots of different guitar courses um hi from florida guys thanks so much for being here i'm, I'm just freaking out I'm seeing 4 all I'm for deb jones so shout out to deb jones at 4 a.m harold is from norway so cool yeah so anyway, guys, uh, the Steve's uh, the workshop series that we're doing for you, or Steve's doing for you, is the Essential Techniques, and it is a multi-day workshop series, and uh, it's going to go going to go live uh, here every other day. If you prefer to watch things on YouTube, um, it'll also be on the YouTube channel. You can check that out. It just, just won't be live on YouTube. We're That's going correct. live with you guys here, and then it will be a replay on on YouTube. That's right. Yeah, that's right. 
So it'd be an encore uh, uh, broadcast. What do they call that thing over there? A, a premiere broadcast or something that, that'll be tomorrow on YouTube. So we're recording this now, and then it'll be put on YouTube tomorrow. Uh, and that'll happen each day. So right now, uh, today, we're doing the essential techniques. We will see you here tomorrow, or sorry, we'll see you here live on Wednesday. And then, uh, or did we mash up the schedule a little bit? Or is it still Monday? Oh, it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then next week, Monday, Wednesday again. Got it, got it. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday this week, and then Monday, Wednesday of next week. All these, if, you, if you're joining us late or you, or you happen to miss one because you're, you're working or you're doing something besides hanging out with us, uh, they'll be on YouTube for you. You can go there and watch them. If you enjoyed this series, I think you're going to really like Steve's course. It's called Essential Techniques. It's available right now at guitarzoom.com. You can just go there and click on the banner that says Essential Techniques and you can get all the information about Steve's new course. So let's jump into it, my friend. Today, let's see what the topic is for today. We're talking about rhythm, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. What okay. we're going to do, let me let me just start off by saying a couple things here. So yeah, sure. Matt wanted me to mention uh, that every new live session is going to be pinned to the top of the private group until the next one goes live, and then we'll pin that one. Okay. Uh, let's see here. That one. Okay, that's fine too. And then what I was going to say, the, the other thing is, is I know everybody has a lot of questions as we get into these sorts of things, but let's try and keep the questions relative to the topic at hand um, because it just makes things so much easier. If we all of a sudden start talking about modes, but we're you know, talking about rhythm, we're just all over the place. So today, everything is based off rhythm. And what I want you to really think about is that when we talk about, you know, I think I think of this sort of category, like we have guitar courses on fretboard visualization. Fretboard vis visualization is huge. Theory is huge. But playing is huge, right? What you can see and the ability to motive, uh, to maneuver around what you can see and understand what you're doing when you're moving are kind of the three primary categories that I always think about when it comes to playing guitar. And so today what we want to do is we want to... Steve, you guys are out of focus? I don't think so. Somebody else can... I don't know why it, it would be fuzzy, but I'm not sure. Um, anyway, um, what we're going to do here is we're going to start off by just talking about rhythm in terms of strumming, and then we're going to talk about rhythm in terms of picking, okay? Cool. So to understand rhythm all the way around, the first thing I always try and uh, explain to people is you're always going to be playing either in a straight groove or a swing groove, okay? It doesn't matter the time signature. It doesn't matter if you're in 3-4 or 4-4 four, four or 5-8. You can be in anything, but the groove itself is either going to be an even groove or an odd groove, okay? Let me shut off my delay here. So whatever I'm doing might be straight or it might be odd or swing. So let's talk about that first. And, and Dan, anytime you want to inter interject, you certainly can. Cool. Um, so when we talk about a straight groove, what we're doing is if we think about a beat, what we're going to do is we're going to subdivide in between this beat with even numbers. So for instance, if we're doing this, we can call each one of these one. One, 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 one. One. If I wanted to subdivide or add more things in between here, I would go to two. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. One, two. If I wanted to go again, I could double that and move to four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. You see? So I can go from one to two to four to eight to 16 to 32. And this is where the names of the notes, that's where they get their, their names, like a quarter note and an eighth note and a 16th note and a 32nd note, that sort of thing. And I don't want to focus on the names of those right now, but just understand that that's what you're doing. So when you hear a rhythm, the first thing you have to do is you have to figure out what you want and what you're capable of playing when it comes to uh, choosing a beat, whether you're gonna do eighth notes or 16th. So let me show you something quick here. I'm gonna play uh, a metronome on Google. You literally just type in metronome and it pops up. Can you hear that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is, this is going 100 beats per minute. So when I decide I'm going to play something, I have to decide either I'm going to play those beats right there. Or 
or I'm going to play twice that fast, or I'm going to play twice that fast. Or I could play twice that fast, but again, then we're going to start getting getting a bit out of hand at that point. So when I'm presented with a song to play, the first thing I have to do is decide how fast am I going to be strumming. And the second thing I have to decide is how am I going to be picking? And this was kind of my point earlier is that all of these things are interconnected. So when you're talking about learning how to alternate pick, it's still going to affect your groove, right? If you're learning about visualizing the fretboard, it's still going to affect the availability of what it is you do on the fretboard. So all of these things are directly connected to each other, and that's why they're all so important. Mm -hmm. so if I start listening to something, let's just say I go to a G chord, okay? And I'm gonna start playing to this beat. So my choice is, Or I might go twice that fast. Now I've heard if you're getting subtitles, I've heard on mobile devices, you, you go to the bottom and swipe up or you do something and it gets rid of the, the uh, subtitles. So if you don't want those, somebody this morning was mentioning that, that there's an easy way of getting rid of them. So just give that a try. So anyway, that's what I start deciding is where I want to be. Now, let's say I move to 16th notes. Now, watch this, because this is kind of kind of crazy. So if I do this. Now, it sounds really busy, but here's the cool thing. If you can play, for instance, in 16th note form, you don't have to play all those. You get your arm moving and you only hit the ones that you want. Watch this. So what's super cool about going faster is not necessarily that you have all of these strums that you're going to utilize, it's that your brain and your hands are available to fill in whenever you want things. If you were going eighth note speed like this, you don't have those available ones that are on the 16th note side. You see, those don't even exist. So you can't play those. If you start off thinking about the 16th note, then all of a sudden you've got all of these different things that you can add in. And then your rhythm starts sounding like this. And it begins to sound more authentic because when you're playing this, to be honest, most songs don't really do that. Now, you could take that eighth note speed and miss things there too. For instance, if I went. And I see somebody's talking about organic strumming, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about is organic strumming. Okay. That's nice. Yeah. So before I move on, though, do, do you have any questions, Dan, or anybody about yeah. that? Yeah. Well, I, I just want to interject, guys, real quickly. Um, we have this message chat board thing up here on the side. This is the first time we've used, Steve and I've used this particular software before, so we're still kind of getting used to how it works. Um, if you have questions about Steve's Essential Techniques course or about the, this particular workshop that we're doing today, which is all about rhythm, which obviously is a very essential technique, please post them into the chat box there and we'll see it and we'll try to answer your questions as best we can. These things are disappearing super fast. So uh, you might have to type a question a couple of times, I guess, maybe. Um, but I'll try to keep some notes here as we go along in Steve's teaching as the questions come in. And then I'll try to bounce them off of you, Steve. Will that work? Sure, of course. Okay. So just make sure, guys, um, that you keep the th this particular workshop they're doing today 
Um, everything is essential is around Steve's new course. It's called Essential Techniques. It's actually available today for the first time ever. It's brand new. No one's ever seen this before. And uh, it's available by Guitar Zoom. You just go there and click on the big banner that says Essential Techniques. You get all the information about the course. This workshop we're doing today is all about rhythm. So if you have a question about anything to do with rhythm, please, we want to know that and we want to help you as best we can. So that will be awesome. Um, but please try to keep the, the conversation to rhythm today. That would help us out a lot. So uh, here's a Facebook user that says, by the way, I'm saying Facebook user, guys, because we still don't see your name. So if you want to tag your question with your name down there, then that would just sounds a little more familiar. If you could do that, it'd be, uh, it'd be cool because we don't actually see your name. Anyway, are you playing from the wrist or elbow? That's an excellent question. Are you yeah, and it, and it depends or? because, again, if you think about it, you're always either going to be moving from the bicep, right, the elbow. You're going to be moving from the wrist or you're going to be moving from the fingers. And, of course, what's happening is every time you move down, things are getting smaller. So when you want a, a big open strum... <laughs> They tend to come from the elbow, but you'll always notice that my wrist is always moving. There's always a motion with all of my arm as I play. And that way, you can notice, too, that I can add dynamics in when I play by striking it harder and softer in different places. But the most important thing is when I, when I first started learning how to play and when I first started teaching how to play, I started teaching everybody patterns like down, 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 up, down, and that sort of thing. And I wound up realizing very quickly that there's a big trap in teaching that kind of playing. I'm not saying that it, it's not good for some people. But the problem is, is when you teach somebody something like, if I only teach you one sentence in Spanish, like, donde esta la casa de Pepe, then the only <laughs> thing you ever say is donde esta la casa de Pepe, because it's all you know. So the problem with strumming patterns is when we get into strumming patterns, if all we do is think about those, you know, when you're trying to play with other people and things like that, you're not thinking like pattern 17 or pattern 32 or pattern 14A. You don't think that way. When the music starts, you start feeling the rhythm, you start feeling the groove, and then you decide, what am I able to add in over the top of this, right? And what, what was surprising to me was oftentimes the slower songs are, the faster you're actually playing because you're doing like 16th notes instead of eighth notes, you see? So, and again, don't get caught up in eighth, 16, all that. Just understand that you're just taking a, a beat, a time, and you're either playing one or two or four or eight or 16. And let's be honest, you're doing one, two or four 90% of the time, unless you're playing Slayer or something like that, right? Otherwise you're doing one, two or four all the time. Well, the faster the tempo gets, let's say I take my tempo and I move it up to 140. Well, your, your singles are already this fast. Now your eights are here, which means your 16th notes. You see, so the song gets faster but that doesn't mean that we're going to strum all that, you know, you're not you're not necessarily going to do that in your song, right? <laughs> so if the song is 140, the first thing I think is, well, what's going to be most comfortable here? So that's the thing to understand about rhythm itself. The core element of rhythm is you've got to listen to something and decide how you're going to react, whether you're going to play. We're talking about a straight beat now, even. One, two, four, eight, 16, and so on. And again, in the real world, you're dealing with one, two, and four most of the time. Okay? I see we've got some awesome questions here, buddy. I want to... Um Again, we're, this is the first time we use the software. So what I'm seeing is not what you're seeing, Steve. So the, 
what I'm seeing is just coming and it's going, and I'm trying to write them well, down. Well, mine does the same thing. Oh, it does? Okay. Well, you only, you could, yeah, the screen only holds like five or six of them at a time. Mine holds two oh. on my end. <laughs> so yeah. I'm like, <laughs> writing stuff down. Yeah. So if I'm seeing them a little distracting, I'm trying to write down people's questions so we can get to them. Um, and I just pinged one of our, our guys, Matt, just to see if there's a better way to do this, guys. Again, I appreciate you guys being um, awesome and hanging with Steve and I as we learn this new platform here. Uh, but one of the great questions um, that that I did read is, do you have to strum all strings on each stroke? Do you have to strum all strings on each stroke? Well, again, this is this is a speaking completely realistic, right? I always think of the guitar as being in sections, like you have a top and a middle and a bottom. The top section is up here, the middle section is in the center, and the bottom is going to be the bottom two or three strings. And when you strum, the most important thing is when you strum, you don't hit more strings than you need. So if you're strumming a D chord, for instance, and you do this, it's going to sound like D. If you do this, it's going to sound like a five-year-old hitting the strings of the guitar, right? <laughs> so the most important thing to understand is in the real world, nobody hits the right strings all the time. It's impossible, okay? Because you're moving. Right. It's like it's like trying to run and hit an X on the ground every time. But you're not just running like you're you're running as fast as you can. You're going to get close depending on how accurate you are. But it's impossible to do perfectly. So what you think about, like with a D chord, for instance, is that you might need to choke up on your motion a little bit. Like we were just talking about your elbow and stuff. When you move to a D, you might not be strumming like this because you might uh, accidentally hit these top strings. So you wind up kind of choking in. But when I strum, I'm not really paying attention to whether I'm hitting four strings every single time. It has more to do with the natural sound and the groove that I'm trying to create that fills in that space, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. if I play G chord, for instance, there are times that maybe I don't even want to hit all six strings, even though they're here. Mm -hmm. Right? So I might want to go. See, I'm separating the top from the bottom and I'm getting kind of this kick drum, snare drum thing happening. So what you need to do is understand that when you first start learning all of this sort of thing, you know, we have chords and all kinds of different tactics that you can use, which are in the Essential Techniques course too, but of trying to develop your chord motions, right? Because here's the, here's the reality of all of this, and hopefully this will kind of help many of you out there, but your left half of your brain and your right half of your brain don't really work together, okay? One side is very analytical and the other side is, is the creative side. So when you're doing stuff on the guitar, if you think about your hands, they're not really friends. They don't really work together in a friendly manner. They have to both be nurtured and developed independently of each other before they can actually become friends and work together. So when you think about strumming at all, now again, we'll get to single note stuff in a little bit here too, but when you think about strumming at all, okay, strumming is a development of understanding the, the functionality of moving the, the pick back and forth. And then it's adding human element like dynamics to give it some sort of musical feel. Then what we do is we start taking that, if you think about my strumming right here, and I'm strumming down up the entire time. And what I do is I start moving away and actually skipping some of those strums. And it starts sounding like a real bona fide rhythm. So what I did was I started off with all of them. And then I start adding some dynamics. And even just that can take a while to get used to, right? And then I start missing some of the strings. Now, if you notice when I'm doing this, I'm not hitting all six strings all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm moving between those three sections of the top, the middle, and the bottom. It just kind of happens. I'm not trying to, to overload my brain by going, go to the middle, 
Go to the bottom, go to the top. I'm just trying to think about how it should sound and how it should feel. And again, this is what practice and, and time spent playing is all about. So as I start developing that, now I start feeling this rhythm, which is the whole thing. It is Rhythm is, a, is an actual mathematical thing that we can look at. But at some point, it needs to become something that our body, and you'll notice when I play, you know, I might move my head or something like that. My body might start moving, my, my, my leg might start moving, right? So I'm feeling this thing. So as I develop that rhythm, and I always tell my students when, when I would teach them things like this, that chords and strumming should really not be practiced at the same time. You can, but there really isn't a large benefit. The benefit is, is learn to develop and feel the strumming that you're doing. And then when you want a chord, you can add that chord in. And you can practice those sorts of things. but And I don't want to go off on, on the wrong tangent, but understand, over here, I've got to train this hand to move from G to D, or D to C, or C to A minor, A minor to E minor. That has nothing to do with strumming. Mm. If I'm trying to learn how to do that, I have to focus on just doing that, which is a technique I call bouncing. You've probably seen me do that before. But that's, that's the whole thing is, is these two things really, they're not connected to each other. This bouncing is not a creative element. It's a yes or no answer. When I move from G to D, I'm either doing it right or I'm not because I focused and I practiced and all these sorts of things. I've spent enough time doing that. It's not a creative thing. D isn't creative. D is D. Now, I can get creative on top of that, but we're not there yet. Just making the D is putting my fingers in the right places on the right strings and in the right frets. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a yes or no, black or white answer, right? That's what mm -hmm. it is. Strumming can be that if you wind up making it a down, 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 up, down kind of thing. What I'm saying is what you want to be careful of is making everything into a down, 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 up, down kind of pattern. Mm -hmm. That's why what you do, and again, I want to get off this in a little bit because there's other things we need to talk about, but if I think about my strumming down, up, I'm not thinking quarter, eighth, sixteenth. I'm just thinking... I hear a beat, and this is what I start, my hand starts moving like this. So once I've developed that, I think about those down and ups and that they always exist. The down and the up are always brothers. They always exist. But what organic strumming says is, okay, so let's do that. Let's start strumming everybody. And then continue strumming, but don't hit the strings. And still keep the beat going. And I would do this like with a class of students. Then I would say, come back. And we should all be back on again. And then mm. I say, move away. Come back. Move away. Come back. And after a while, you get used to shutting down that part of your brain that's telling you down, 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 up, down. And you just start hearing, dun, 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 da, 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 da. And you start playing what you want. But because this keeps moving, I'm keeping time with the music, you see? Super cool, dude. I yeah. love the in and out thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the yeah. whole thing is, is if you can learn to think about, you hear the music, you decide how you're going to move your arm, and then you start moving and missing things and hitting things. And then you, if you, if you can at the end, you start adding dynamics where you maybe hit this one a little harder or this one a little softer. And again, it doesn't have to be like every third one. You don't have to pack everything in at once. It's just learning this process. See, when I add more strumming, it's going to add more energy. When I strum less, it's going to leave more space for the other musicians that I'm playing with, the singer or whoever it might be. Now notice that versus this. See how different they are? Now I'm not saying that a strumming pattern is bad. There are songs that have strumming patterns. There are songs that need strumming patterns. What I'm saying is if you learn how to play and all you do is play by strumming patterns, you're missing the creative outlet that is strumming, that is rhythm.
because right. you just built a two plus two equals four concept. Right. So it's really important to do that. Now, I see a lot of people asking about this too. Hey, so, hey can I put your pause just for a second, Steve? Oh, yeah. We've got a backlog of questions. There's like, um, I'm actually having Matt post them all into this one big sheet so I can see them all. And I'm just glancing over right now. And it's like, <laughs> and, yeah, and with these live things, you can't get to, to every question. But like, sure, sure. You know, the, the forefront is you've got a topic to discuss, and then you do your best to answer as many. Exactly. Questions. And what we're what we're talking about. I mean, if you guys are just joining us now, there's this um, the the entire workshop series that we're doing here for you over the next few days is essential techniques. And Steve has a new course. It's cleverly entitled "Essential Techniques" by Steve Stein. And guys, this thing is an unbelievable course. It's like six hours long, I think. And I just want you to understand that we are talking about one aspect of one technique, which is strumming, rhythm, essentially, in, in that's part of this entire course. And if we can, uh, I definitely want to get to some questions, but I, I was just looking at this thing that you sent over, Steve. I want people, I'm, this is kind of, I've never done this before, by the way. I... Can I share my screen and can you make me big? I see I have a share screen thing down here, but I want to show people something. This is really interesting. You guys are going to get to see something I don't think we've ever publicly shown before. Uh, share screen. And I want to show you this. Now, I don't know if you can see my screen or not. Can someone please? I, I got control of it, yeah, so they can see it now. They can see it now. Okay. Guys, what you're looking at is the mind of Steve Stein put into a mind map. And the reason I want to show you this is because this is the way, as you were talking, Stephen, you're breaking things down step by step. I just want to, I want people to understand the degree to which you go to make sure you explain things in a step by step manner and, and where what we're currently talking about fits. This new, this, in, this is Steve's mind map that he created for this new course. It's called Technique 2020. We didn't really know exactly what it's going to be called. It's called Essential Techniques. That's the name of the course. Um, and it's available at Guitar Zoom, of course. And, but this thing is a mind map of everything that Steve's teaching in this course. And this is him just sitting down and saying, here's what I want to teach in this new course. He's got guitar set up. He's got chords, open chords, power chords, bar chords. If you look at over here, there's lots of detail about that. Here's the bouncing thing that Steve talked about earlier. Bouncing, the lift and shift technique. Sliding to the power chord, two versus three fingers. Small controlled strumming. Uh, strumming. Controlling the strings that you're not playing, which actually is always um, a challenge, especially for young player or new players. And then you just take a look. We're just talking about one thing right now, which is strumming and rhythm. But inside this course, look at all these different, we talked about scratching a little bit today. Uh, motion of movement, down versus up strumming, patterns, kicks and snare strumming. Look at all of this. All of this is available for you in the new course uh, called Essential Techniques. And this is just scratching the surface of it. This is the, the rhythm part. He's also going to talk about picking and uh, picking hand development. And then there's more soloing things like harmonics, dynamic tools, uh, guitar tones, sound effects, finger picking, hybrid pick picking, using a capo. Two hand tapping, playing octaves, string skipping, arpeggios. And each one of these has a branch of like more things to learn. Like just look at the arpeggio ones major, minor, sevenths, major sevenths, minor sevenths, Randy Rhodes concepts. This thing is huge. And uh, everything that we're doing right now is related to Steve's new course, Essential Techniques. So, uh oh. Steve, are you with me? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, <laughs> I left. <laughs> Sorry, dude. Well, that's okay. I, I suddenly I didn't see you, and I was like, "Oh, where's he?" <laughs> yeah. uh, so everything we're talking about today, guys, is just one little section of this big course, Essential Techniques, and uh, the entire workshop series is mm -hmm. going to be on various topics. Today, we're just talking about rhythm, and so why don't we jump over and do a few questions, or I'll, I'll, I'll pick one that I think may be relevant for you. How about that, Steve? Yeah, go ahead. All right, guys. Thank you so much for bearing with us, by the way. We're still kind of learning this technology. If you have questions, please post them. Um, yeah, this person says, it's a no-brainer. This course is essential in order to become a more aware and nuanced player. Oh, yeah. One of the things I did want to mention, uh, techniques is sometimes a little hard to understand. 
uh, in terms of like, what is technique? It's easy to understand. Uh, Steve's course was released uh, a few months ago called Blues Licks. Huge hit. Huge hit. Everybody loved it. It's really easy to understand Blues Licks. You know what you get in that course? You learn how to play Blues Licks. <laughs> Essential techniques is like, dude, that's a lot of stuff. Uh, so I wanted to show you that so you have a clue about what it all is. But it can be applied to any level. So, well, I would say, correct me if I'm wrong, Steve. Unless you're a true, absolute beginner guitarist, this is for you. Unless you're just starting out, you're probably well, not for not for the absolute beginner, right? Well, it. I mean, it even could be for the absolute beginner, but there are better things for an absolute beginner. Okay. Um, but I mean, like, if you were an absolute beginner, just learning how to do, I mean, because everything, everything in this course is built on its complexity, too. So it starts off with the most simple elements and moves into the most fun and fundamental elements and then moves into the, the more elevated elements, you could call them. Right. So any level, guys, that you're, that you're currently playing at, I guarantee you there's something in this course that's going to help you level up. And um, right now it's on sale. And it's going to be it, the price is going to go up, and what whenever the deadline is, I, can, I don't even know. Uh, but it's on sale right now, and it's available for the first time today, actually, at Guitar Zoom. So you might want to check that out if you think that this is for you. So let's go over to the questions, Steve. And uh, my goodness, there's a lot of them. Let's see here. Let me just pick one here. Hang on. I'm sorry, guys. Oh, cool! And I have the names in here too. Thank you to everybody that, that asked the question. Angie, Frank, Bill, Ignacio, Doug, Bill, Verdon, Todd, uh, Samuel, Francis, Richard. Guys, thank you so much. We're not going to be able to get to all these, but I do want to get – Just let's just jump in uh, to one of them here. Um, this person says, are there – and I think you kind of touched on this. Angie actually says, are there common strumming patterns that can be used for most songs? Well – Yes. I'm, you know, if you do something straightforward, like um, if you were to do like a down, 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 up, down would be the most basic one that you could do. Um, and it fits with anything that would be straight, right? Where you can also do, so think about that. I'm going down, 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 up, down. And I could keep repeating that over and over. Okay. And then the next thing you could do would, would be to funk it up a bit by doing what's called an eagle strum, which is going down, down, up, up, down, up, down, down, down up, up, down, up, down, down, up. And if, like just different patterns like that. There's a couple of those that work really nice in general situations that you find yourself in. Um, and like I said, it's not that strumming patterns are bad. Strumming patterns can be very beneficial. What I learned early on in teaching strumming patterns is that when I taught strumming patterns to students, whenever they'd play, guess what they would play? The strumming pattern, right? So even though the song may be giving them a bit different groove or something like that, they, they never really practice the availability of being able to listen and respond to the music as you're, as you're hearing it. So again, it's always figuring out where the downs and the ups should be relative to the tempo of the song. And then it's learning how to hit and miss in different places. Now, needless to say, no matter what you do when you strum, you're hitting a down or an up, in, and at some point, it's all mathematical, right? I mean, at, at some point, everything gets repeated. But it's, it's in your playing. If you were to play for three minutes and do the exact same strumming pattern, after a while, it gets a little old to the listener. Where if you could add dynamics and add some variety in there, it winds up sounding a little bit more interesting. So Nice. Another one we have is... Um, this is, and Steve, I was wondering, maybe some of these we could give like a quick, like yes or no, I think that would be maybe be helpful to people. And then you can deep dive on whatever you want uh, that, that might resonate with you. Um, the, Doug Smith says, Steve, why is, and this is a good question, I think. Why is the utmost importance of strumming and timing often overlooked? Well, because everybody's trying to get to scales and speed and flash and solos and <laughs> and that's why. <laughs> Uh, Bill Verdon says, how does adding distortion change how you strum? I don't know that it really changes how I strum, to be honest with you. It depends on the level of, of distortion. You know, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm going to be playing power chords and I'm going to be doing something heavier, now my strumming is going to change 
because I'm playing power chords versus strumming openly. You know, if I was strumming, if I was doing something clean. It doesn't, it doesn't really change what I'm going to do, um, except that a lot of times as we get more distortion in there, it's nice to have those breaks. You hear those punches and it sounds really cool. <laughs> nice. Um, Francis asks, any suggestions on how to get back on beat when you get off? Well, stop. I mean, honestly, the, the most important thing is, is that, and I talked about this a little while ago in one of those Monday motivation things, but um, the most important thing when you're playing is that you never lose your surroundings, the, the music that's happening around you, whether it's a backing track or a metronome or a band or something like that. You never want to get so deep in yourself that all you're doing is concentrating on you. You have got to learn how to share your brain space with the sounds that are happening around you because that's, that's what music really is. And what happens is sometimes when we're doing something, you know, we're, we're practicing, right? And we're so intense on what it is that we're doing that we're not listening around us. That listening element that I keep thinking the back of my head, but that listening element has to, it has to exist all the time when you play. If you're going to play with somebody or something. Nice. This is a, um, a very honest assessment. Richard uh, from London says, I have no natural rhythm. Is this something you can learn and develop? If so, how would I train for this? Well, the, the best way, to be honest with you, when it comes to not having a sense of rhythm, it has to start with listening. It's not an instrument thing. It's not a guitar thing or a piano thing. You've got to learn how to listen. You've got to retrain yourself to think about how to listen. Like, like what I do with students a lot of times, or what I used to do with students a lot of times, is I would take a song, and instead of starting the song at the beginning of the song and then counting, which we would do over and over and over, like I would take a, a student and I'd start the song and we'd count together, one, two, three, four, one, two. So they know it's four, right? So they know they're counting to four. Then what I start doing is I take the song and I just move the needle to somewhere in the middle of the song, and I just start playing the song. Mm. They have to listen and try and figure out where the one is to start counting again. So there's the availability of being able to feel this that we have to learn how to do. And then there's the availability of being able to go two, three, four, one, two, three, to find that one. Those are two different things. And they don't happen through learning a G chord or a, the, the, the guitar has nothing to do with it. It has to do with just sitting there listening to music, but having somebody help you guide you to know where that is helps a little bit. Mm -hmm. I've always said rhythm is really weird because it's almost like trying to explain a color to somebody who's blind. They have no reference. Mm -hmm. Like if you can't feel rhythm, it's hard to have a reference point. But that's why if you work with somebody that, that can help you by talking to you and explaining it to you and listening, and the most important thing is listening, they can maybe get you to see that color that they're, they're, they're seeing. Love it. Uh, Steve, a question, uh, and this may have been answered already, but is this, is your new Essential Techniques course uh, a, applicable for acoustic guitar learners too? It is, it is to a certain degree. I mean, there are certain things like finger picking and things that are specifically for, more for acoustic. Um, in the strumming and rhythm section, definitely. Well, there, there's all kinds of things. I mean, even picking. I mean, we use all of those techniques, whether it's acoustic or electric, but yes. there are certainly sections of the course that are, are geared toward electric players that want to learn how to do arpeggios and sweeping and things like that. But don't kid yourself for one minute that there aren't acoustic players out there that smoke at that stuff because there are. Right, right. You know what I mean? So it, it really sure. could be either, either or for sure. Um, hey, I'm going to ask Matt or whoever on the team is available to answer. Uh, there's some really specific questions coming in about the Essential Techniques course. Uh, one of them is, is, does it cover tremolo picking? And uh, let's see, tremolo picking and strumming are taught in the course. Strumming for sure. Tremolo picking, I'm not sure. 
Uh, Matt, if you can look at the mind map that Steve created on all the topics on this course, you might be able to find similar picking in there or not. There's just a ton of things on that mind map. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah I talk about speed picking in there. Um, I don't remember if I talk about tremolo picking per se, but we talk about speed picking, three note per string yeah. picking, you know, that kind of thing, arpeggios, for sure. stuff like that, yeah. Um, man, these questions are so good, guys. Thank you so much for submitting this and just hanging out with us. It's so awesome just to just to be here with you guys. It's so fun. And for me personally, I don't get to do this enough. Um, let's see. Sam says, do you always have to... Oh, no, we already covered that. You always have to strum all strings on each stroke. The answer to that is no. Um, Steve, we, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Jennifer says, I have a habit of holding the pick with three fingers instead of two. Is this wrong? Well, it's not that it's wrong. Okay, you find a way that works for you. The, the one downside, well, there's really two, to holding the pick with three fingers is that you have a tendency to grip more because you're using more fingers to hold. So you can get a bit more tension here. But for me, the most important thing is, is I use my fingers for like, I use my middle finger for hybrid picking where I'll pick with my pick and then pick with my fingers. So when you learn to do things like that, you know, when you play, you can learn to play scales and things like that using that middle finger to pick with, okay? And like hybrid picking in general. So that would be the only thing that I would say is that, that I would see as a bit of a detriment is if you ever wanted to get into some of the more modern techniques using that middle finger for hybrid picking is a really important thing to, to do. Mm -hmm. Man, uh, here's one from Adrian. He says, when you're trying to develop better rhythm strumming, what is better to establish your practice? Faster beats or smaller fraction notes at slower beat speed? For example, try to try 16th notes at a slower beat or 8th notes at a higher speed. Well, they're going to they're gonna overlap each other anyway. So if you're trying to practice, again, think about your practice as two different things. You're trying to practice a comfort zone. That's one thing. Because when, when you play, the thing that, that a lot of people don't realize is when you play with, with other musicians or you're writing music or whatever it is, or anytime you're put into a, a, a situation where you have to decide on something quickly, you have to understand what you're good at and what you're not good at. That's, that's part of the battle here. Because mm -hmm. there's no guitar player on the planet that can do everything. They just do what they do really well, right? And that's what we see them doing all the time. So if you're given a tempo of 130, for instance, you should already know what it is that you're capable of doing, what's comfortable, what your go-to is going to be in terms of your strumming and things like that, right? Now, if you're trying to develop your speed, a great way to do that is just start at something like 100 and practice eighth notes until you get to 200. When you get to 200, you can go back to 100 and you're doing 16th notes already. Mm-hmm. So, because this is what I do for like picking exercises and things like that to get people better at, at picking and stuff like that is we, we use, we start at whatever. Again, 100 is an even number, so it's easy. But we start at 100, we start doing eighth notes or two per click until we get to 200. When we get to 200, we go back down to 100. Now we're doing four per click. Right. And it's just an easy way to train your brain to think about it. So you, you'd know if you hit 160, you know whether or not you're going to be doing two of strumming, of picking, or whatever, or if you're going to be doing four. That's going to be relative to what fits the, 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 the musical situation you find yourself in and what fits you, what fits your comfort zone. Nice. Uh. One quick question from uh, Andy Hickman says, Steve, I have a lot of your courses. Is this one going to have different stuff in it? And Andy, I'll answer that for Steve. Um, rhythm, I mean, all this stuff overlaps to a certain extent, right? I mean, if you have a blues lex course, you're going to have some type of rhythm in there. So rhythm is one of the techniques that Steve's teaching in the essential techniques course. But the difference, I think, in this course and all the other courses that Steve's created over the years is this is all of what Steve considers the essential techniques in one place. So it's not just you're getting a piece of, of, uh, of technique in, in another course. This, is, this thing is solely focused on the essential techniques that every guitar player needs to learn in order to become a better guitar player. So right. And if you think about it, the, even the name essential techniques, like you need to learn how to strum 
and how to control the groove, not just strum. Like we get this mentality in our brain that goes, oh, I understand down up strumming because there it is. I just down up strum. I got it. We've got to learn to manipulate and control the things that we learn. With control, you know, we gain confidence. And that's, that's the whole thing is, is as you practice things, essential techniques are techniques that you need regardless of whether you play acoustic or electric or country or rock or blues or whatever. You know, we always equate like speed picking with, you know, metal or hard rock or something. We don't think of it in terms of blues, but then you watch someone like Joe Bonamassa and go, oh, no, 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 it exists there too. Because what you're dealing with is just a manipulation of tempo. Mm -hmm. An eighth note, a 16th note, a 32nd. That's all you're dealing with, right? But then you've got to be able to apply that. You've got to learn not only to understand what it is, but, well, how do I do it? right? That's what techniques are all about. So the course isn't made to be for advanced players, right? But as the course goes on, there's more refined elements that are specific to certain people. Like you might go, wow, I really want to learn how to speed pick, or I really want to learn how to play arpeggios, or I really want to learn how to finger pick. Well, the average speed picker probably doesn't want to learn how to finger pick, right? So there, there's different specific techniques for different people toward the end of the course, where the first half of the course is all all absolute fundamental stuff. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Just to give you guys an idea about this thing, um, I'm just glancing over the mind map, and we should probably get a link to this somewhere on our website so people who are interested in the Essential Techniques course can actually see all the different topics uh, in there. So somebody on the team can maybe grab Steve's mind map and just put it there on the sales page. That would be pretty cool. I think people would dig that where they're getting information about the course. Anyway, um, yeah, vibrato. I mean, I'm just glancing over this thing. There's guitar and amp set up. There's chords, strumming and rhythm, which is what this workshop is on. That's just one aspect of this course. There's picking and hand development, uh, picking control, uh, fretting hand development, so legato techniques. And then the more, as it goes on, it gets a little more advanced. Um, hand synchronization. There's a whole entire section in this course just on bends. Whole bends, half bends, three fat bends, blues bends, unison bends, harmony bends, <laughs> double pumps, siren bends, bend slides, bend pull offs. I mean, that's all. That could be a whole new course just right there on bending, really. Uh, there's vibrato, there's hand, uh, sorry, did I already say hand synchronization? Slides, arpeggios, string skipping, playing octaves, two hand tapping, harmonics, dynamic tools, guitar tone tools, sound effects, finger picking, hybrid picking, and capo. Those are all the topics, and every one of those things is broken down into subtopics. So it's a big course. And another cool thing I just thought about, Steve, is that you don't have to go through this thing from start to finish. You just need one game-changing technique that you can apply in your playing to make this entire thing worth it. I would think, That's, right. Right? That's right. Cool. All right, buddy, let's bounce, bounce back to a few more questions here because I just really want to get as many of these out of the way as we can because sure. people will take the time. On the screen here, it says, do you use a thinner pick when you strum versus power chords or lead? Uh, I use thick picks and, and then it just says and, but um, I use the same pick for everything. That's not the same way that everybody works. Um, you know, some people like a thinner pick when they strum and believe me, they really do sound different. Like if you use a thinner pick on an acoustic guitar, you really hear that kind of, airiness to a thinner pick but I, a i'm lazy and b i i lose picks constantly i i've learned to play with just one size guitar pick for literally everything that i do um but when you're in the studio and you're recording and things like that it's nice to have a variety of different picks because they really do sound they really do sound different so a couple of easy ones for you steve what kind of amps does steve use for most of his lessons most of my lessons are done with either my Kemper, my Hughes and Kentner Black Spirit, or plugins. I have all kinds of different VST plugins that I use, but I think most of the time I could say it's probably my Kemper. Okay. Any ideas? Uh, sorry, I missed the name on this one. Can't find it. Shoot. Um, any ideas on strap height as it relates to strumming? Well, again, if you're standing up and playing, the most important thing is not how cool you look. And I, <laughs> believe that I that sarcastically, if you've played in a band and you've toured, there's there's a, an element to, there's the rock star guitar look like Slash, and then there's comfortable. 
And the older I get, the, the further up my, my, my uh, guitar tends to get. But that's the thing is, is you got to find a, a, a place that it feels comfortable on you. I actually have a strap coming soon. I forget the name of the company, but it actually has a little clip that you hit and it lowers the, you can lower the guitar to wherever you want it for certain songs. And then you just hit it again and it goes back up again. It's just that's a cool. string extension that I wish somebody had created a long time ago. Cause sometimes you, you know, it feels kind of awesome to have the guitar a little bit lower. And then sometimes you got to have it up for more articulate things. Dennis says, what do you do when you're playing rhythm and lead? Uh, sorry. What do you, what do you do when playing rhythm and your lead guitar gets off course? Do you stay on the course or do you, Go ahead with your lead. <laughs> I'm sorry, I did a bad job reading that. Yeah, I'm not sure what what that means. I if, think, if you're playing lead and you get off, I think that's the question. Because if you're playing lead and you get off, then you get back on. I mean, again, <laughs> I am, I'm never, I am never not connected to the music that's happening around me, and I'm not saying that egotistically. What I'm saying is, I can't not hear it. So if I'm playing on stage with a band and, and the solo comes up or whatever, I might make a mistake in the solo, right? Or God knows what, I break a string. I mean, there's all kinds of things that, that can happen. But I never disconnect from the music that's happening. So even if I was to make a mistake or whatever might happen, I, I still am connected to the music. So I know how long I have left in the solo and I can feel the beat and, you know, Oh, that all comes through rehearsal, and I can't stress enough to everybody how important it is that you understand that guitar isn't just fingers on the fretboard. That is absolutely crucial, but it's not the only element. So much of music has to do with how you hear it, how you think about it, and how you respond to it. Like, that's, that's half the whole battle in itself. We can't respond without being able to do things. We can't respond to music if we don't know how to strum or we don't know chords or whatever it might be, right? That's Those are the tools that we have. Mm -hmm. But our ability to be able to listen to the music at all times is what keeps us where we need to be. Doesn't mean we don't make mistakes. It just means the mistake, we can, we can follow that up with something else because we know where we are. Yeah. Guys, I uh, see a comment on here from Todd. He says, hey, thanks, Steve. Oh, sorry. This thing keeps jumping every time I start to read it. He says, uh, thanks, Steve and Dan. Great stuff. Uh, purchased the Essential Techniques course at the beginning of this live stream. All of Steve's courses are gold, in my opinion. I just want to um, uh, thank you so much, Todd. Really appreciate your support. Guys, if you're interested in any of this technique stuff, uh, Steve's new course, Essential Techniques, it's for you. And it's available at guitarzoom.com right now. It's on sale. There's some extra special bonuses that are available right now, which um, during the launch, is gonna, you're going to get all of this cool stuff along with the course. And then uh, the price is going to go up and you're, it'll still be available, but it'll just be at a, at a different price point. Still a bargain, in my opinion. And uh, I do want to ask that, guys, if you, if you got this course, Steve and I would love to know what you want to get out of it. Why did you actually purchase it and what is your goal of and, and what's the one thing that you want to get out of it because remember with a course like this you have to learn it all it's a big thing right you can just jump in there and say i want to get my chops up uh in regards to strumming and so you can just go straight to the strumming section just focus on that for a week or two weeks come back to the other stuff later on but we'd be interested to know if you get this course what's the one thing that you want to accomplish out of it and uh, when you state your goals like that, often you have a much better chance of actually accomplishing them. So that's another good reason to, to come back and tell us. Plus, we just we love to hear from you guys. See, we've been going for about an hour here. Um, we've covered a lot. Um, is there anything else that you want to do today? Should we take some more questions? Are you pretty smoked, man? I know you already had a live session earlier today with uh, another group. Well, there's another section I'd like to talk about if we have oh, time. Oh, okay. Cool, man. I'm, I'm just here to... to oh. uh, so okay. here, see a lot of people like I just had. Um, let me let me see this one here. Me, rhythm comes naturally. Don't really think about it. Playing by ear may be the reason. He says, "Is there a way to identify what beat you're playing without the use of a metronome?" And the thing is, is that again, don't overthink this stuff. If you're feeling it already, that's fine. But I always think in the re because I've always tried to teach students to think about things in terms of the real world. Like what I would love for you is to be able to play with other musicians, whatever that means. And you might already be playing and that's awesome, but everybody isn't. 
And and the question always comes up, well, why is that, right? Why, why aren't you? Are you not confident enough? Do you not feel whatever? And the thing about playing is the more you put yourself in various situations through your practice, the more you can deva- or develop confidence in those different situations. So let me show you something. So let's say, for instance, we go back to 100 beats per minute here. Hey, Steve, you might want to minimize me. Oh, gotcha. So here, let's do this. So if I was going to practice this, and let's say I'm doing quarter notes, which is just going to be this. Not much happening here. Okay? But I still need to make sure that I can actually play on the beat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build what I call a tree. I'm going to go from quarter note to an eighth note to a triplet to a sixteenth note and then come back down. And I'm just going to do this with the zero on the sixth string, but you could do this with a scale. Maybe you're practicing pentatonic. Maybe you're practicing diatonic. You can do this with anything. Okay. So once I start it, what I want to do is I want to learn to feel that quarter note. Okay. It's not a lightning strike. It's not. It's bigger than you think it is. You've got to learn to feel that beat. And again, I know it's just a quarter note, but you've got to learn to feel it. It's not just like, you can't do that. You've got to learn to feel it when you play. And you can feel it through the motion of your hand. Notice how this is coming from my wrist. So let's move to eighth notes. Now you're going to notice I'm doing eighth notes with downs. I'm feeling that first one each time. So even if I get off a little bit, like we've been talking about with some of your questions, I, I, I feel the next one coming so I can get back on again. Okay. Now you could do these as alternate picking if you wanted to, like this. And that would be okay. So next up, we've got triplets. Now, this is a different one because when I do this, I'm going down, up, down, and then up, down, up. So every time it clicks, I'm going down, up, 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 down, up. Because my pick just wants to do this. It doesn't want to go. I don't want to make different patterns. I just want to feel my arm doing this the entire time. So I'm going down, up, 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 down, up. And my pick is just going down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, like it always does. So as I'm playing, thinking about lining up down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. Then you can go into your 16s. See, I could use any of these with scales. Like, let's say I went. Or. Or. Right? Whatever it would be. Wherever you are in your in your practice. But learning how to feel these different rhythms. So I know at 100, I can do this. But I can't do this. Or at 120, I can do this, but I can't do this. And it's not a bad thing. It's it's just awareness. So you know what you can and can't do. It's very important to learn how to do that. So that's something that I think you should try and work on as well. Um, and I think that's probably pretty good. We can do some more questions cool. if you want. But I think that's just a really great practice tool for people to use. Yeah, I love it. Um, man, there are a lot of questions. Guys, uh, as your questions keep coming in, let's just try to, if you could help Steve and I, um, today we're just doing rhythm. So if you're asking questions about scales and other things, uh, we are going to do additional workshops for you. So you'll definitely want to join us. We're doing this one today is Monday, October 12th. Uh, this is live. It'll be as a, uh, replay, replay, what do you call it? Encore, whatever, premiere thing. It'll be available on YouTube tomorrow. Each day, we're going to be publishing these on YouTube. So you can go to the Guitar Zoom YouTube channel and uh, check out this workshop series. Just look for essential techniques. And then we'll put all of these there for you so you can go back and watch them later. Um, 
But one of the questions we have here, Steve, is how do you know when you're ready to jam with other players on a regular basis? And what should you expect? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, I, you know, when I first started playing out, I was pretty terrified because you just never know if you're good enough. And mm -hmm. it's just a whole new world, right? I mean, you spend all this time practicing in your room or whatever, and then all of a sudden you have to be around other people and 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 try and make a musical connection with that, let alone a personal connection and all of those sorts of things. And it's, it's kind of hard. You know, I always tell people an easy way through is if you start off, you know, maybe you have a, a small local church or something that you could play in just to kind of get a feel for playing with other people. Or maybe you have some friends, um, you know, don't think of it as a band so much, but friends that you can get together with and just hang out with on a Sunday afternoon and, you know, play some music. You know, when I was a kid, I used to get together with a, a neighborhood kid that played drums. And I'm sure we were awful. I am absolutely positive. <laughs> but it was fun. Like, it was really fun. And it was an experience because I'd never played at that volume before. You know, because yeah. I'd always play with my stereo and stuff like that. And then here comes this drummer over to my house and he sets his stuff up. And I'd never, other than being maybe at a concert or something, I'd never heard drums that close up in my life. And he was loud. <laughs> the drums are. So then all of a sudden my amp had to be loud and that that initial experience of going, I like this, this this volume thing I could get used to. Um, but I never would have known if I hadn't jammed with him, you know? Right. So then you start getting used to, well, how do you work with at volumes, right? Because now I'm not at a bedroom volume anymore. Now I'm at an at a actual volume. Well, do I have the right amp for that, right? And how do I control the feedback and all these other things come up? So there's always questions about that stuff. And so I don't know that there's ever a perfect time. I just think people are so critical about themselves or toward themselves that they take too much time. They keep making an excuse to not get together with people, you know, where I, I guarantee you the majority of people aren't as far ahead as you think they are. You know what I mean? So true, man. So. That's, that's wisdom right there, guys. I think you heard him, what he just said. The majority of people are not nearly as good as you think they are. Uh, here's I, a quick. Recently, go ahead, buddy. Uh, I, I just, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I just heard a, a I listened to um, uh, Sirius XM a lot. There's a, a station called Volume, and Eddie Trunk is on there. He was interviewing the guitar player from uh, The Cult. And I thought it was really interesting because he goes, What's the number one thing that you would never want the world to know about you? And he said, Being found out. And I thought that was the perfect answer because. It's the truth. It doesn't matter if you're Steve I. It doesn't matter who you are. They're all amazing. Don't get me wrong. They're all amazing. But they can do what they do, and they can't do what they can't do. And they right. don't do what they can't do in front of you. And I think there comes a point in your life where you have to say, I don't care what I can't do. This is where I play, and I'm just going to do the best I can, and I'm just going to do what I do. Or, or build yourself realistic goals but don't give up everything else in the in the pursuit of that goal. Like don't don't not practice because you want to develop your your alternate picking. I think it's wonderful you want to develop your alternate picking. But learn what what's available on this platform. You know, the people, the music, whatever it is you can do and then keep striving to the to the next level. Claudio asks, do does the angle of the pick matter when you strum chords? I don't really angle the pick when I strum chords. I angle the pick more when I'm picking strings and I have to kind of get more efficient. When I strum, I tend to stay pretty flat. And again, I'm using a really thick guitar pick right now. Um, but, um, you know, really thin picks, they just, they feel really good when they bend and kind of slide through the strings. And there really isn't much of a reason to have to turn it on a strum that I'm nothing that's really coming to my to my mind. I think you could keep the pick pretty straight. Yeah, we have a question here, guys, uh, from Bill. He says, "I see that the bonuses that are included with the Essential Techniques course are for the first 100, 200 buyers, and so forth. How do I know if I can get all this? I don't know who bought, and I don't want to miss out on the bonus stuff if I still buy now, guys. I just want you to know that if you uh, decide that Essential Techniques, Steve's new course," is for you, we'll make sure you get all those bonuses. 
because we want to take care of everybody in our group here. So don't worry about that. We'll make sure that you get all of those, even if the deadline's already passed for those particular fast action bonuses that you're talking about. Um, don't worry about that. Don't let that hold you back. We'll make sure that since you guys are hanging out with us, um, that you get all of that. Okay. So don't, don't worry about that. Uh, Melek Kaiser says, this is a very interesting name. By the way, it's so fascinating. We have people from all over the world. I'm still, to me, it's just mind boggling. So cool. Um, Oh, speaking of that, I wanted to ask everybody, if you could, please respond back if this time works for you. Steve and I really didn't know what time would be a good time. I'm on the Pacific Coast time. Steve's in uh, Central time. So we chose 10 o'clock Pacific, noon Central for us. Uh, but we have people from all over the planet who showed up. So if you could just let us know if this if this time works for you, that'd be awesome. Also, if you, if you went ahead and got the course, please come back and circle back and post in here and tell us what you hope to accomplish from it. What's the number one thing you want to get, take from it? Anyway, Melek Kaiser says, does the development of rhythm technique ever get to the point where you can play a new riff without even thinking about it? Or will it always be necessary to learn the riff first before you can become proficient with it? In other words, Steve, are you with me? No, I'm with you. I'm just, I'm not sure I'm oh. really understanding that question. Uh, in other words... I think what he's trying to, he, uh, Malik, I'm not sure if that's is a, I don't know. Anyway, Malik says, the development, does the development of rhythm technique ever get to the point where you can just play a new riff without even thinking about it? Or is it necessary to, I think he's saying break it down like you were doing in the beginning of this thing, like tick, 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 tick. Again, they're all different. I mean, I, I as, as your ability and your understanding of, music and the musical situations you find yourself in improve, there's more things that you're able to access very quickly. That doesn't mean everything, of course. I mean, there, there's always going to be some things that, you know, if you get some crazy periphery song or dream theater song or something like that, you know, oftentimes those are going to take some, some practice. Um, but that's why there's got to be a balance between the, the daily practice routine that you're putting yourself through and the musical situations you're putting yourself through. Like I always try and tell people to find a balance. Like you need to work on technique, no doubt about it. But you also need to be working on learning how to play songs or a riff or, I mean, there's, there's just all kinds of different things um, to kind of balance those things up because then you're also putting these techniques in motion. You're putting them into a real situation where you can feel them and you can hear them and you can see them being applied. Um, so there's no doubt that the better you get at all of these things, the easier all of those things become. But there's always going to be stuff that's, you know, escalated in terms of complexity. Mm -hmm. And guys, if you want to learn a bunch of songs, I don't even know if you know about this, but Steve has an entire membership. It's called Play Songs with Steve Stein. And it's a whole bunch of songs all in one annual membership. And you get access to everything, all the songs at once, instantly. You can check that out at playsongs.com. That's playsongs.com. That's Steve's uh, membership for learning all different types of songs. And that entire, that entire uh, membership is all about songs. It's got technique and all this other stuff. So um, if you want to learn that, that's available for you. Bro, we've been on here for like an hour and fifteen. You still are you? You still got some fuel in the tank, or what? I want, I want to get this. I don't know if you can see this on the screen, but somebody asked, "Do you always count when you play or go by feel?" And this is a very confusing thing for people to understand because feel usually means I didn't go to school and I didn't have a teacher and I just play by feel, and counting means I went to school and I studied music and I count. And they're not. They're not that it, neither one of those are true. Feel is something that you use when you play to make the song sound more musical, more authentic, more gelling, if you will. But counting is something that always has to happen to a certain degree. Again, when I play, I, I can't say that there's a certain amount of one or the other that's happening. They're all always happening. But like I said, depending on what you want to call it, like I remember, you know, with Eddie Van Halen passing, I remember he used to talk mm -hmm. about like scales and how he never really knew scales. He just played. And that might be true to a certain degree, but he most certainly knew scales because <laughs> right. he played in key. 
Now, he might not know the names of those scales, but that doesn't mean he didn't know them, right? So, so sometimes the terminology can be kind of confusing. You can play with feel and still count at the same time. Very much so. Those two things can be synonymous or not synonymous, syn not synonymous, but exist in the in the same realm together. So you might be feeling the beat or feeling the groove, but you're still subconsciously kind of counting in the background. Man, what do we take from here? I, I want to just remind everybody that we're going to be doing several of these workshops. We can't pack everything in here at once. Um, today was just on rhythm. Yeah. So, so go ahead, buddy. Oh, yeah. Just I was just going to say, yeah, I mean, we, we've got one coming up again Wednesday. And what we'll do is I'm just going to keep trying to throw you some things that you can practice. And um, and then if you wind up, you know, if, if essential techniques is something that you're looking for, it's got all of these things in there. Um, but the most important thing is, is, is all of these questions that you have, you know, whenever I do these sorts of things, whether I go live, you know, on Mondays or I go live, like we have a VIP group, I go live once a month with that. People always have a lot of questions. And the goal is, is to try and get you to think about some of these things. And maybe some of these things that we talk about are going to answer two or three of those questions if you just think about them a little bit. And, um, and reassess the way that you're approaching your practice. That's what I want you to do is think about every day when you practice, work a little bit on technique and a little bit, I don't mean five minutes or 10 minutes or 20 minutes. I don't know what I mean. I mean, every day you should work a little bit on getting better at some element that you need in your playing. At the same time, you should try and find some things that are inspiring or motivating that you can see everything happening for real. And for me, it's always been songs. I think songs are so important because if you pick a song that you love, like when I was a kid, I wanted to learn how to play Highway to Hell because I loved ACDC, right? Or I wanted to learn how to play Carry On Wayward Son or whatever it might be. When I started figuring out that I could play those songs, maybe not every part, maybe not every part perfectly, but I could get from point A to point B in that song and I could put my record on and I could play it. It felt really good. And the reason I was able to play that, again, maybe not perfect, maybe not all the parts, but I could play from A to B, is because I had developed certain aspects of my technique, certain aspects of my availability to be able to listen, and then apply those while I'm playing. And I still use those things today playing in bands. That's, that's exactly how I see things. I'm just not in my bedroom anymore, right? But I still sense all those same things. So that's what I want you to think about with your daily practice. Steve, you're an awesome guy, man. Thank and you. I appreciate you. And I know all these amazing people who showed up today to hang out with us. Also appreciate you. Um, thank you for sharing your gift with us. And I truly believe, um, I know you get nervous and I give you a bunch of compliments, but just, <laughs> just listen. Everybody feels the same way. I'm just basically summarizing what everybody says. Just, just go and look at the, hundreds of thousands of YouTube comments of people uh, and who are super appreciative and all the testimonials of people who actually invest in your courses. Um, you have a real gift, man, for not just being able to play, which everybody knows you're a great player, um, but also to be able to, to teach and to break things down in a way that's easily understandable. And I think all of us as guitar players have had the experience where you know somebody who can really play but they can't really explain how they do it. And I think when you have when you have the gift that you do, which is to be able to break things down, that's why you're able to help literally millions of people. I, that video that you had, the uh, How to Solo in Five Minutes, I don't know if you've noticed this, but it has over 9 million views now, that one video. The only way a video on YouTube gets 9 million views is, especially for guitar players. I mean, how many guitar players are there on the planet? I don't know. But it's people getting benefit from that and then sharing it with each other. So I think that speaks volumes about your abilities. And um, I just can't tell you what a privilege it is for all of us to be here with you and hang out and get all this amazing value from what you're teaching. And uh, thank you for making this course, because I think it's something that's been lacking in our, in, in our repertoire of courses. We don't have anything that's really specific to techniques. And finally, we do. Everything we've talked about today is available guys in Steve's new course. It's called Essential Techniques. It's available at guitarzoom.com. And right now it's on sale. 
And right now there are some special bonuses. And then if you uh, decide to jump in, we will make sure that you get all of those fast action bonuses, even if they're already sold out. So we'll go ahead and make sure that everybody who joined us today will get that if that's what you want, if you want to sign up for that. Um, we're doing another workshop coming up Wednesday, guys. So we hope that you'll you'll come back and hang out with us again. If you, for any reason, missed any of these, we're going to put all the recordings on the YouTube channel in a nice, tidy playlist for you called Essential Techniques. And uh, well, be please in a come back and join us on Wednesday. Do I think? Say it again. Uh, all live sessions are going to be saved in a private group in a separate unit called live session replay. So oh, they're, cool. they're going to put those in the actual Facebook group as well. Oh, so. cool. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. And so for sure, guys, come back and join us on Wednesday. Um, if you join us late, this will be available as a recording. You can certainly watch it. Thank you again for being here. And uh, thank you for all of you who already took the step and invested in essential techniques. I think you're going to love it. Please come back and, and tell everybody what you think about it. Uh, we would appreciate that. And we will see you on Wednesday. Anything else you want to wrap up with, my friend? No, just stay positive and keep practicing. All right, guys. Thanks again. We will see you on Wednesday. Talk to you soon, guys. Go practice hard.